Uh, in Lincoln Cathedral, uh, there is a unique canvas chosen for a tree of Jesse sculpture. Uh, this uh, tomb slab currently located in the northeast of the nave. Uh, as you can see, the slab, uh, made of termite stone, is well worn in places and badly damaged in others, especially compared to other termite slabs and fonts. Uh, most of this damage likely comes from the time it's spent out of the cathedral proper, exposed to the elements in the cloisters. Uh, this renders many of the figures unrecognisable. Uh, the tree here is fairly typical, bearing more of the flourishes that one would expect to find in manuscripts than the established and rather rigid layout found in stained glass. The uh, figure of Jesse was presumably sleeping along the bottom, but is completely missing now, with uh, the possible exception of what may be the top of his head in the lower left-hand corner. Above him, encapsulated in a mandorla-shaped tree, is David, identifiable by his harp. Uh, he also holds what is probably the Psalms, although the craftsmen are making use of the iconography of the Ten Commandments, probably under the mistaken belief that this is an interchangeable representation uh, of an important religious text. Above David is the Virgin, uh, is the Virgin and, um, and at the top sits Christ with his arms raised in blessing. In between the figures uh, in the tree are seated three pairs of prophets and a pair of angels. Of these, only the figure of Moses, who appears between Christ and the Virgin, is identifiable as he is depicted with horns. Uh, the mystery here does not lie with whether this is a tree of Jesse image, but rather it lies with the simple question of whose tomb is it? The, the initial attribution for the slab, uh, which is still purported today by a Victorian inscription around the tomb, was that it was for the cathedral's founder and first bishop, uh, first bishop of Lincoln, Remigius de Vercamp. Uh, this was first suggested on the slab's rediscovery in the cloisters in 1857 by the Anglican vicar, George A. Poole, who, upon seeing the slab, immediately related it to Gerald of Wales's description of Remigius's tomb uh, in his vita, the bishop, uh, for the bishop, Gerald wrote that a fire in 1124 caused a timber to fall onto the tomb and break it in two. The significant crack across the middle was pointed to as evidence. Paul then wondered whether Gerald uh, could more exactly have described the condition of this very stone if he had it before his eyes. Uh, we even have a drawing of the slab published by Paul, although as you can see, it's rather lacking in quality. In 1872, the slab was brought back inside the cathedral by its chancellor, Francis Charles Massenbaird, and placed in the position where Remigius' tomb was originally thought to be, the position that it still holds today. Uh, but there are a number of reasons as to why this attribution is incorrect. First, it would be very early for a turnistine slab, which uh, usually takes around to the middle of the 12th century. And second, there are a number of problems with the iconography. It would be the second oldest extant Tree of Jesse image, uh, the first depiction of David with a harp in the Tree of Jesse, and the second oldest depiction of Moses with horns at all. Individually, these could simply be explained away as iconographic anomalies, but together they indicate that the iconography does not match with the proposed date, uh, instead more likely dating to the end of the 12th century, when all of these elements were adopted into and became established parts within the tree's iconography. Uh, more recently, George Sarnecki and Elizabeth Schwartzbaum have suggested that this is the tomb of Bishop Alexander, who restored the cathedral after the aforementioned fire and was well known for his extravagance and wealth, earning him the moniker Alexander the Magnificent. Schwartzbaum suggested that it was Alexander, uh, that the tombs was Alexander because the two other tomb slabs found in Salisbury and Ely. These, she claimed, are respectively the tombs of Alexander's uncle and half brother. Bishop Roger of Salisbury and Bishop Nigel of Ely. There are, however, some problems with this, other than the problem the iconography that it shares with Remigius. Firstly, uh, according to this theory, this theory, Alexander commissioned and paid for the slabs for his Episcopal family uh, as their own wealth and power was stripped from them in 1139 by King Stephen for their alleged support of, of the Empress Matilda and her cause. Alexander, however, retained his wealth and power, so could, according to Schwarzbaum, be able to afford to treat his family to expensive tomb slabs. The slabs must therefore have been commissioned between 1139, Roger's death, and 1148, Alexander's death. This leaves the third recipient, half-brother Nigel mm -hmm. Ely, not dead for at least 21 years, a rather morbid gift to give and at such fast expense, and a seemingly unnecessary one for, after Henry II ascended to the throne, he appointed Nigel back into his old position in the Treasury to sort out the financial trouble caused during the anarchy. 
Uh, he clearly regained much of his lost wealth and power in the position, as in 1158, he spent £400 to secure the position of treasurer for his son, Richard. Secondly, Schwarzbaum also suggests that Alexander, as a learned churchman, chose the tree of Jesse for himself, whilst relegating Roger and Nigel to standard funerary effigies. However, although the Episcopal effigy of Roger's tomb would become commonplace in the years that followed, um, at the time of his death, a tomb of this nature was on the cutting edge of iconography for England, showing that Roger, or at least whoever commissioned his tomb, was learned enough to keep up with the duties of the latest funerary fashions. Also, even if Alexander were a more learned churchman than the other two, there seems to be little reason as to why he would choose the uh, tree of Jesse for his tomb. Uh, James King, however, disagreed with Schwarzbaum's theory, suggesting that the itinerary of Alexander's continental visits left no time in which he could have ordered the tomb, suggesting that it was commissioned by his successor, Bishop Robert de Cheney, uh, along with a new Ptolemy stone font, uh, font seen here. Robert, though, suffers from the same problems as Alexander and more. King's suggestion that the damage to the cathedral in 1149 siege of the city by the Earl of Chester resulted in the need for a new font and then also, and seemingly just because why not, a matching tomb, all because similar damage occurred at Ipswich Cathedral during the siege in 1153 seemed shaky at best. And King makes no attempt to wrestle with the tomb's iconography, not even mentioning that it is a tree of Jesse, let alone why it would be chosen by Robert, nor for whom. Uh, there are then two major problems arising with the suggestions of the tomb's owner so far. Why have Tree of Jesse on the slab, and why move the slab from the cathedral? Although I briefly toyed with the idea that the slab could be that of uh, St. Hugh, the problems seen with the previous suggestions are still issues here. This is why I would therefore like to swerve and suggest that yes, this was the slab, the tomb slab of Remigius, just not in the ways posed by Poole and Chancellor Messingbird, Rather, it was from Hugh's attempt to start a cult of the founder during his time as bishop. In 1192, the centenary of the death of Remigius, Hugh commenced with the rebuilding of the choir and the east end of the cathedral. This work, supposedly carried out uh, to repair the damage of, an, on a, of the earthquake of 1185, provided the perfect opportunity to not only consecrate a local, consecrate a local saint for Lincoln, but to create a suitable space for him, just as happened with the fire of uh, 1174 in Canterbury. Uh, this was the start of the period where saints' cults really reached their height. With the death of Thomas Becket in 1170, Christendom had found its archetypal saint whose cult would be copied across Europe. It's no surprise then that Hugh's new East End saw an expansion of the cathedral beyond the Roman wall, adding what Peter Kitson described as a kind of copy of the corona at Canterbury. Uh, Hugh was a noted collector of relics, supposedly owning a ring in which he could store the relics of over 30 different saints. Of course, though, Hugh's most famous relic collecting story is the time when he bit two pieces off the arm bone of St. Mary Magdalene. This happened at Fecamp Abbey, the institution where Remigius was based before he was granted the bishopric of Dorchester uh, by William the Conqueror in 1067, the see which he later moved to Lincoln. Hugh's relic collecting uh, especially his desire to own a relic from Remigius's home abbey shows his enthusiasm for saints, and so it sounds the reason that he would wish Lincoln to have its own saints cult. Hugh was no stranger to canonization attempts, as he was one of the main supporters of getting Gilbert of Sempringham canonized, although this wouldn't happen until two years after Hugh's death in 1202. Um, it is at this time we also find a Vita written for Remigius by the noted historian Gerald of Wales, the Vita Sancti Remigi. This Vita was written between 1196 and 1199 and clearly implies that there was an expectation that Remigius would be canonized. And it probably serves as a sort of audition tape for sainthood. It would seem then that uh, Hugh was rebuilding the East End to be the center of a new cult of Remigius with the tomb slab as the miraculous focal point. On his deathbed, Hugh even requested to be buried on the north side of the East End out of the way so as not to obstruct or injure those who pass by likely his presumed pilgrims of Remigius. However, with Hugh's death in 1200, not only did the drive for the canonization of Remigius end, but a far more fitting candidate was presented to build a cult around, Hugh himself. However, it does appear that a new tomb slab may have been made for Remigius during Hugh's episcopate, as an examination of the miracles listed in Remigius's Vita reveals. 
The miracles can be divided into three sections. Uh, one, before the fire of 1124, two, after the fire of 1124, and three, after the martyrdom of Beckett. In section one, there are four miracles, all of which take place at Remigius's tomb. However, after the tomb is said to be broken, none of the three miracles in section two are located there. It is only after the martyrdom of Beckett that the tomb is mentioned again, appearing in eight of the nine miracles there. We can see that uh, there are more miracles attributed to Remigius in the time after Beckett's martyrdom, and likely only from the start of his episcopate in 1186 than the 74 years before, and with a greater variety. It seems probable, therefore, that new miracles only started happening at Remigius's tomb after the new slab was installed to form the centerpiece of his nascent cult, or rather that, Hugh, uh, that Gerald and Hugh wished to present the new tomb as having miraculous powers and encourage pilgrims to visit it. Uh, a turni slab for Remigius is also in keeping with other turni slabs in England, which uh, we can see have two uses. One, it could be used to honour a deceased bishop, such as uh, the examples already seen in Salisbury and Needley, as well as with the tomb of either Abbot uh, Gilbert Crispin or Abbot Gervais at Westminster. And two, it can be used to commemorate the founder of a church, such as with Walter de Gant at Bridlington, uh, Guntrada, the wife of William de Moran at Southover, and Siebert, King of East Saxons and legendary founder of Westminster Abbey. As we can see, uh, both of these uses fit for Remigius, who moved to the sea and the seat of the primacy from Dorchester to Lincoln in 1072. We can now examine uh, why the slab was carved with a tree of Jesse. To this end, I shall put forward three minor and one major reasons why I believe this to be the case. Uh, the first minor, re minor reason is that the Tree of Jesse was a Marian image, and the Lincoln Cathedral was dedicated to the Virgin by Remigius on its foundation. Uh, in this, uh, medieval theologians certainly enjoyed wordplay and double meaning, so Remigius may have been seen as the Jesse from which the current cathedral rose. Uh, second, a lead tomb marker for William Dencor, son of the major Norman landowner, the Earl of Lincoln, implies that Remigius himself was a relative of William the Conqueror a not unlikely proposition, as he was both present at the Battle of Hastings and the first Norman to be appointed to an ecclesiastical position after the conquest. If the royal connection was true, or at least accepted by the time of the construction of the tomb, then an image mixing royal and ecclesiastical power like the Tree of Jesse would have been most fitting for Remigius's tomb. And third, there was the birthing ritual at the time, sometimes known as the Tree of Jesse ritual, but more commonly called the um, Holy Mother's ritual due to its invocation of the aid of biblical mothers like Mary, Elizabeth, and Anne. In some other versions, it's also called upon Selina, the mother of St. Remigius, who baptized Clovis, the first king of the Franks, on Christmas Day 496. Uh, it could be that Remigius, who was almost certainly named after his Frankish forebear, was associated with this ritual and thus associated with the tree of Jesse. However, I believe there is a major reason as to why, one major reason as to why the Tree of Jesse iconography was selected for Remigius's tomb, but this first requires some background. Uh, when the Tree of Jesse was first created in stained glass within the overtly pro-monarchy Royal French Abbey at Saint-Denis uh, by Abbot Suger in 1144, it was, create, uh, it was clearly placed there with the intention of drawing comparison between the kings of France and the royal ancestors of Christ. Uh, it is strange, then, that its first use in English stained glass was in the new Corona Chapel at Canterbury Cathedral, uh, a space made to venerate the recently murdered Thomas Beckett, uh, allegedly killed on the orders of the king for his defence of the church from the oppressive monarchy. The monks at Christ Church did not have to do this. They did not have to select the tree of Jesse iconography to feature in their new stained glass. They did not have to use the same monarchical design found in Saint-Denis, and they did not have to place it within the focal point of their new East End and yet they did. I believe that the only explanation for this is that they were bending the Sugerian pro-monarchical message of the Sandini tree back against Henry. They wanted to humiliate the king and teach him uh, with the good kings of Christ's ancestry. For why else was the Canterbury tree uniquely labelled, and why else does it specifically feature Josiah, a good king who respected and expanded the powers of the church? They wanted to remind anyone who looked at the tree that Christ and the church is quite literally on top. Uh, this isn't only relevant due to the close uh, architectural links between Lincoln and Canterbury that have been spoken about by many historians, including Hughes Corona, which I spoke of earlier, uh, nor the artistic links, which I don't have time to talk about today, but which may have stretched to a tree of Jesse in the stained glass of Lincoln. 
but also in a strange and dire prophecy made by Hugh, uh, recorded in his Magnum Vita. In chapter 16 of the second volume of the Vita, um, Hugh's chaplain and close confidant, Adam of Eansham, uh, in the decades are uh, written by uh, Hugh's chaplain and close confidant, Adam of Eansham, in the decade after Hugh's death, we find this. Uh, out of place prophecy regarding the Plantagenets, supposedly made by Hugh as he lay dying in London in 1200. As you can see, this vitriolic prophecy makes use of tree imagery, uh, accuses Eleanor of Aquitaine of being an adulteress, her only mention in the entire of the Vita, and expresses support for the French monarchy, specifically calling for their rule over England. Uh, Gerald of Wales, the author of Remigius's Vita, was a famously outspoken critic of Henry II and his sons, and yet Hugh had uh, had him write Remigius's Vita anyway. In his own work, De Principus Instructione, Gerald penned a, cha a chapter entitled The Origins of Both King Henry and Queen Eleanor and the Totally Corrupt Root of Their Sons, in which he aims a similarly vicious attack against the Plantagenets. He tells the story of Eleanor's grandfather, uh, William the Ninth, who absconded with the wife of one of his vassals, and, in failing to heed the warnings of a hermit sent from God, sees his offspring cursed to not be happy fruit. Gerald then continues accusing Eleanor of adultery before lamenting that England is a breeding ground for tyrants and that its people long to be ruled over by the kings of France. The similarities between Hugh's prophecy and Gerald's story are stark, and that, that may be as Gerald claims to have got this story from Hugh, who he said often heard it lamented by Henry II himself. It would appear then that Hugh and his colleagues shared the same anti-Plantagenet sentiment held in Canterbury and employed the same iconography, the Tree of Jesse, as a weapon to attack the monarchy. However, this still does not explain how the slam ended up in the cathedral cloisters. If we look at the customs of the divine service in the Liban Niger of Lincoln Cathedral's Dean and Chapter from about circa 1260, uh, the short period where Hugh's East End existed, uh, then we can see the sensing of the cathedral went in the order of the high altar, the tomb of Remigius, the altar of the Virgin, and the tomb of St. Hugh, before going simultaneously down the south and north aisles. This implies that Remigius' tomb had been moved into the, east, uh, with, uh, into the east end with Hugh's rebuilding. However, with the construction of the angel choir uh, in 1256 to 1280, the slab would have been moved again as it would have been in the middle of the new expansion. Once the Angel Choir was finished, it, it was kept as a Hugh-only space, with other popular local saints like Robert Grosstest and Little St. Hugh being kept out and buried in the South Transept and South Choir Isle, respectively. Remigius, though, was supposedly reburied to the north of the High Altar, uh, the traditional burial place of founders. Uh, this is somewhat supported by the recording of a visit of Edward I to give oblations at the cathedral in 1300, uh, in which he goes to the shrine of St. Hugh, the head of reliquary of St. Hugh, the tomb of St. Remigius, and then to the tombs of Robert Grosstest and little St. Hugh, giving seven, seven shillings to each. Uh, this is likely recorded in the order that the shrines were visited, which means Remigius' tomb is still up in the East End after the completion of the Angel Choir. Um, it's at this point, though, that I must venture into some complete speculation, for as you can see, the modern tomb uh, marked as Remigius is, Remigius is, is simply covered with a blank slab. Uh, perhaps the old slab was not in keeping with the new aesthetic of the choir, altar and east end. Indeed, it is likely that Remigius's fame had waned to such an extent that with the construction of the angel choir, the tomb slab would have been seen as superfluous to Remigius's new role as a minor local saint. Ultimately, though, it was Hugh himself who was the driving force behind Remigius's canonization, and it was uh, Hugh's own far more fitting candidacy for sainthood that would see Remigius fail. Uh, thank you very much. So on the 20th of May 1503, John Reed, merchant of the staple of Calais, wrote his last will and testament. The preamble noted that he was of sound mind and memory, but saw that he was in imminent danger of death. The will was short, perhaps reflecting the nature of his health, but it spoke of a conventional piety commensurate with both the date it was written and his status as a prosperous merchant. Indeed, the only bequests were religious. There were no gifts of money, clothing or jewellery to relatives or friends. 
The parish church of St Peter and Paul at Wrangell, Lincolnshire, received the most attention in Reed's will, being the place of his burial, but other ecclesiastical institutions also benefited, such as the Mother Church at Lincoln and the four mendicant houses in nearby Boston. Reed ended his will by appointing his wife, Margaret, and his sons as executors, urging them to faithfully complete his bequests to full effect. This then was a relatively conventional will, despite its overwhelming emphasis on the pious. But what makes it particularly interesting is the fact that Reed's tomb in Wrangell survives and that the inscription thereupon is one of a handful in England that refer to the trope of the bad executor. The perimeter inscription reads, Therefore man, when the wind blows, make the mill grind, and ever on thine own soul have thou in, have thou in mind, that thou gives with thy hand, that shalt thou find, and that thou leaves thy executors comes far behind. These verses were playing to a relatively common theme that urged the pre-Reformation laity to dispose of their goods and money in pious works before their death, rather than leaving them to the executors, who were cast as greedy, avaricious and cruel. The trope predates Reed's tomb by several hundred years, finding its origins in moralising pre-conquest poetry and in later works such as Robert Manning of Brun's Handling Sin and Dives and Pauper. It played on the penitential insecurities of the laity and has been described by Thomas Kinney as an outburst of complaint and admonition that was highly emotional, full of anger, fear, bitterness, grim acceptance, hopelessness, frustration and finality. But the paradox of its inclusion on Reed's tomb and the existence of his will pushes us to reconsider the function of such monuments and suggests that they were not as unmediated or emotional as has previously been thought. Instead, this paper will argue that the meaning of the trope is modified by its inclusion on tombs and that it in fact did not represent popular attitudes towards executors as some have claimed. While several historians, such as Nigel Saul and David Griffith, have emphasised the peculiarity of the verse on monuments, concluding that they were the result of the whims of idiosyncratic patrons rather than a widespread distrust of executors, there remains room for them to absorb a more focused analysis that places the trope within the function and form of the tomb itself. By considering the visual schema of these monuments, particularly the intersecting matrices of images and text, as well as their penitential and instructional functions, we are able to more readily appreciate how the trope would have operated and how it was viewed by contemporaries. As with all pre-Reformation monuments, the vagaries of iconoclasing, rebuilding and renovation means that we are left with only some of the anti-executor tombs that once existed. In addition to Reed's tomb, the earliest to survive is the brass of Richard and Marion A. Dane at Kelshall in Hertfordshire, which was laid down in 1435 while A. Dane was still alive. Other brasses once existed at Blakesley in Northamptonshire, commemorating John Elaine, who died in 1460, and at Hampton in Arden, Warwickshire, which commemorated Richard Brooks, a local bailiff, and his wife, Isota, and which probably dated from the 1490s. Both are recorded in antiquarian sources, the latter by Dugdale, although both have since been lost. The only other known survival is a large incised alabaster tabletop tomb in the crypt of Hereford Cathedral, which depicts Andrew and Elizabeth Jones, a local mercantile family, who probably commissioned their monument in 1497. Other antiquarian records also note the existence of at least two monumental inscriptions that make reference to the trope in London, in the churches of St Peter Cornhill and St Edmund Lombard Street. No dates are provided for either, um, and there is no name recorded for the former, but the latter commemorated Richard Nordell, a draper. I've also included on this map um, references to a group of encaustic tiles associated with Great Malvern Priory, which all included the verse. Um, they date from the 15th and early 16th centuries, and a group of them um, either remain or were once known to have existed at Great Malvern Priory itself, nearby Little Malvern Priory, St Mary's Stanford on Team, all in Warwickshire, St Mary's Hereford, St Mary's Priory in Monmouth, and in the chapel at Raglan Castle. Although clearly not two monuments, these tiles share an almost identical poem with Andrew and Elizabeth Jones's tomb, and demonstrate how the trope might have been disseminated locally. There are, moreover, literary groupings between the verses on the monuments that are shared both between each other and with other media. The most common is the poem on a Dane's tomb, which is shared with the two London examples and that of Richard and Isota Brooks. John Stowe also included a version of it in his survey, calling it an old proverb 
and a longer example is to be found in the early 16th century commonplace book of Richard Hill, a London grocer. The poems on the brasses of John Reed and John Alain are, as far as is known, unique, um, although they both utilise themes of grinding and milling to represent doing goods works during one's life. If these monuments did not represent emotional popular attitudes towards late medieval executors, it is primarily because they were subject to a lengthy and multi-state process, one that included their oral genesis as spoken poems, the patron hearing and perhaps learning the poem, the decision taken to include it on a tomb inscription, discussions and contracts with craftsmen, um, the process of manufacture itself, and finally, the reception of the poem by viewers at different times and in different contexts. All of this suggests that at some point after learning the verse and responding to its message, the patron made the decision that it was suitable to be included in a memorial and therefore that it served some purpose that was intrinsically tied to the tomb itself. If, as is generally accepted, the primary function of pre-Reformation monuments in England was to encourage pro-anima prayers from passers-by, then it is not unreasonable to assume that the trope of the bad executor was at least partially included to fulfil this goal. Indeed, anyone who could not rely on executors were perhaps more in need of the intercession of friends and strangers. Several of our examples also took recourse to stock phrases requesting prayer, often immediately placed after the anti-executor verse. The Aidan inscription asks onlookers to say a paternoster to the Trinity for their souls, while reads praise to Jesus of mercy and grace, I heaven, to have a place, and that of John Elaine asks God to have mercy on his soul. This view is also upheld when we consider the other elements on tombs, all of which were designed, at least to some degree, to incite prayers. Visual markers of status acted in this capacity, in addition to demonstrating more worldly concern. Several of the effigies, John Reed, Richard Brooks and Andrew Jones, for example, all include images of the classic mercantile purse hanging from their belts as a means of placing them within a wealthy and pious community whose members might be more inclined towards sympathy for their purgatorial plight. Reed's brass goes a step further and includes heraldic de depictions of both his merchant's mark and the arms of the staple of Calais, which was probably especially efficacious as his final resting place lay just a few miles outside the busy mercantile port of Boston, and so was well connected via overland and overseas trade routes. Without exception, all the figures depicted also hold their hands together in prayer, which is both a performative gesture and acts as a proxy for the deceased by participating in the liturgy in their place. This also emphasised their piety and therefore their worthiness for commemoration and is bolstered by the inclusion of text which likewise draws attention to their good works and deeds. The best example of this is on Reed's tomb. The inscription plaque at their feet does not contain biographical details but rather an exposition of Reed's virtues. He is described as good and just and it is stated that he had never harmed anyone nor caused them loss. His faithfulness to Christ and the church, as well as his charity to the poor, are also mentioned. Likewise, the perimeter inscription on the Joneses' tomb states that Jones had rebuilt and repaved the space, described as a charnel house, at his own costs in time for the Feast of All Saints 1497, because it had long stood derelict. This was clearly intended to be perceived of as an act of charity that would benefit the community at Hereford. It might also be pointed out as a means of underscoring their intercessory function, that both of these examples were written in Latin rather than in English, in direct contrast to the anti-executor verses themselves. Although issues with medieval literacy are not entirely straightforward, it can probably be reasonably assumed that this precluded the comprehension of the majority and was perhaps directed towards the Latin literate priests and clerks who would have been using the space. In this sense, it was an aid memoir for those whose prayers and masses would have been most efficacious. Finally, the location of the tombs is also of note, although this is just as much to do with the fact that most of our examples would have been relatively wealthy members of their parish. Reed's will did not specify where he wished to be buried, but his brass is to be found in the centre of the chancel of Wrangell Church, which subsequently became the preserve of his family. The most dominant monument in the church today is a descendant of Reed, and several of his sons and their wives all requested burial in the high, chance, in the high choir of the parish church at Wrangell. They have created a family mausoleum in the most sacred space of the church, close to the location of the mass and where the parish's priests would readily keep them in remembrance. It is also recorded in antiquarian descriptions of the church that in 1528, John's son and executor, Richard, had caused the chancel roof to be rebuilt 
and included an, in an inscription on a crossing beam that urged onlookers to pray for both his good estate and the souls of his mother and father, whose brass lie, lay directly below. The situation is similar at Hereford Cathedral, as the Jones's tomb stands in the same space of the crypt to which the inscription makes reference. Moreover, it continues that Jones had well and laudably instituted a chaplain to celebrate in ages to come therein, for their souls and all Christian souls, further uniting the monument, the space of the crypt, and the cathedral's liturgy as a means of navigating purgatory. At Hampton in Arden, Brooks's brass was not necessarily placed near an altar or the chancel, which was reserved for a local gentry family, but instead lay in the centre aisle of the nave, directly opposite the church's entrance, as revealed by this 19th century plan. It would have most likely been on any ceremonial routes utilised by the parish on feast days or special occasions, and meant that anyone entering the space would almost immediately be met with the likenesses of Richard and Isota. A final example perhaps demonstrates this most clearly of all. Richard and Marion A. Dane's brass lies at the step of the chancel with the figures positioned so as to directly look towards the high altar. The church was rebuilt in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, and so it is not unreasonable to suggest that the date of 1435 on the inscription represents the culmination of this rebuilding. It might too be suggested that the Adanes commissioned or paid for the now mutilated rood screen in front of which they lie. Stylistically, they date from around the same period, and their placing suggests that they were clearly meant to work in conjunction with the saintly eyes of Edward the Confessor and Edmund the Martyr, in addition to two unknown bishops gazing down upon them. The second main function of many pre-Reformation monuments was to edify or to instruct. Contemporary texts such as the Book of Manners advised the laity against utilising their monuments for ostentatious and self-congratulatory displays of wealth and status, or even pitiful requests for sympathy. This, it was thought, was a subversion of the most important role of the monument, which was to work as a didactic tool that edified the living for the benefit of their souls. Indeed, it is within this instructional impulse that we should perhaps view the inscriptions that warned of the false executor, thus placing them within the thought world of which they were a product, rather than taking their text at face value. Here, I want to draw parallels with images in the space of the church that utilize memento mori tropes. As Paul Binsky has argued, cadaver tombs and brasses forced an encounter with the viewers in the space of the church, recalling well-known stories such as the three living and the three dead, which often also shared the same space as the tombs, such as this example at Wickhampton in Norfolk. Reminding onlookers that existence was ephemeral and worldly status futile, such images frequently served a didactic purpose through the interplay of picture and text and by emphasizing division and confrontation. Whether consisting of three skeletons juxtaposed with three princes or a cadaver that brass and a living viewer, the trope encouraged a dialogue between two characters who are purposely at odds, living and unliving, natural and unnatural, as a means of imparting their lesson. It is clear from the inclusion of anti-executive poems that the tombs under discussion here were intended to have a similar effect, a thought which is borne out by further consideration. Both passers-by and those actively engaged in the remembrance of the deceased were drawn into an encounter with the image and were confronted with its warning. This link is further underscored by the now lost inscription commemorating Richard Nordell at St Edmund Lombard Street, London, which combined both memento mori and anti-executor verses in a continuous, if not seamless, fashion. John Weaver recorded that the inscription began with a 16-line series of rhyming, rhyming couplets, which specifically urged readers to observe the tomb and to contemplate their own demise, including the line, such as the are, sometime were we. The two elements were therefore inherently associated in the minds of both Nordell and the viewers of his tomb, and their reciprocal cautionary function was thus emphasised. Moreover, the format in which the warnings against executors were commissioned underscores their monetary function. The ubiquity of verse as a means of expressing the trope is striking, and it was an effective method of communicating moral and social values to both literate and non-literate audiences. The structure, syntax and rhythm made for a mnemonic aid which encouraged repetition and recitation. In some instances, this was made explicit. In exhortations, oft to have this in mind, for example, on the inscriptions of Nordell and Aidane. Nordell's tomb emphasises the instruction to remember through further repetition, ending with the contemplative words, think on this. <laughs> 
We therefore see the double function of such verses, first in their very format of short pithy stanzas, which simultaneously encourage attention and retention, and second in explicit instruction to the reader. If the aim was to both encourage pro-anima prayers and to impart an, a moral lesson, then the association between verse and memory is a natural one. Indeed, the discourse between the living and the dead in instances such as these is quite likely to have been reciprocal, with the living praying for the dead soul and the dead offering pertinent advice to the living, furthering the idea of interactions with the anti-executor tombs being encounters. For example, the use of the vocative man in most of our examples invokes the sense of direct instruction to the reader, especially when it is preceded or followed by an imperative, think, behoveth, or look. The lack of further qualifiers suggests that the address is directed toward anyone reading on account of the universality of the message. Moreover, the structure of the verses on the tombs of Aidan and Nordell further encourages the sense of a conversation or exchange. Although there is not space in the texts for the viewer to respond to the dead's admonitions, the use of enjambment, wherein the sentences continue over the end of the poem's lines, gives the verse a conversational feel, and it was perhaps envisioned that the reader would, would respond later through taking on the actions, through, through their actions sorry, in taking on the advice. This sense is further emphasised on the tomb of Andrew and Elizabeth Jones, seen here, as the verses are portrayed as direct speech shared between husband and wife. The implications of speech scrolls would have been familiar to contemporary viewers, acting to, bridge, to bring the image to life in a performative manner and bridge the gap between orality and the written word. Whereas the viewer would likely expect to see a prayer depicted in such a way on a tomb, they are instead here confronted with a lesson. The format and function of anti-executor tombs, therefore, shares many parallels with memento mori or cadaver tombs. Both urge viewers to contemplate their own mortality, their preparedness for death, the threat of purgatory and the promise of salvation, and also urge sympathy for the deceased. If, as this paper has emphasised, we should attempt to properly contextualise the trope of the bad executor, then these similarities in the combination of image and text, the type of language utilised, the setting of the church, and the concern to impart both a moral and a spiritual lesson, therefore suggest that the anti-executor monuments were informed by a wider cultural, artistic, and literary heritage. But there is one crucial difference that we should note. The deceased on the brasses and tombs of Aidane, Jones, Brooks, Reed, and Elaine are all shown as living rather than dead. This, of course, might simply represent a desire to display the trappings of status, but it also serves to further enhance the message being offered. This distinction is important for, their successful, for the successful operation of their didactic purpose. Cadaver tombs aim to shock their viewers and frequently invoke the notion of the tomb as a mirror into which viewers must look. But, as Julian Luxford has recently pointed out, viewers were not reflected by them, but reflected upon them. In contrast, by using images of living people while consciously recalling memento mori motifs, anti-executor tombs instead offer reassurance, perhaps even hope, that there was still time to take heed of their lesson while the viewer lived. Such an interpretation is once again confirmed by the interplay of text and image. Emphasis is placed on the ability to act during life while simultaneously recall, recalling the certainty of death through phrases such as, remember thy life may not ever endure, and while the wind bloweth. In the case of Elaine's tomb, the metaphor of milling and grinding, that is taking advantage of one's life, was given further substance by imagery, as it was recorded in the 18th century that the figure of Elaine was placed under the depiction of a windmill. In this sense, while the bad executor trope on, trope on tombs certainly took cues from memento mori themes, they form a distinct and perhaps unique genre of their own through their combination of didacticism and vitality. But nevertheless, as the reader internalised and contemplated the message of the bad executor with the dead advising them, uh, the space around the tomb in the church would be transformed into a stage upon which the scene being played out was a parallel of a well-known encounter. It is unknown whether or not any of our patrons had some now unrecoverable experience with executors that predisposed them towards the message on these tombs. The date of death on Aidane's tomb was certainly never filled in by his successors, which later commentators have picked up with relish. But, as I have argued, we should not take the limited prevalence of anti-executor verses, both on tombs and in other media, as indicative of a popular distrust or ambivalence towards executors. Certainly on monuments, it was but one part of a wider post-obit strategy 
alongside other visual and textual elements, which work to both elicit prayers of onlookers and to edify the laity. Instead, we should perhaps locate the efficacy of the verses in the fact that, by the 15th century, will-making was becoming far more common and of greater social importance. The evidence of wills themselves and the few extant sets of accounts kept by pre-Reformation executors instead indicate that testators trusted their executors with complex provisions, and that, on the whole, executors proved worthy of this trust. Moreover, many individuals would have lacked the requisite capital to establish suitable post-Ovid foundations such as anniversaries and chantries while they were alive, and it was therefore only after the liquidation of their estate and with the help of their executors that these endeavours could be realised. We should then see these verses for what they were, pithy, satirical and personal, but also recognise the fact that they played a role in a much wider discourse than taking them at face value might suggest. Thank you.